Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. If you'd like any of your Ramadan related questions answered this month, you can email us at questions at amau.org. وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول. The question we're going to answer today is as follows: A revert is struggling with a bad environment at home this Ramadan, but can't move out and struggles to balance between worship and helping their non-Muslim parents. What is your advice? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam ala al-mab'uthi rahmatin lil alameen Nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in So this question relates to a revert Muslim who is going through a hard time at home who it appears from the question is uh, concealing their faith and not telling their parents about it who's struggling to pray uh, and who is struggling with the month of Ramadan. So we'd like to start by asking Allah Azza wa Jal Al-Hay Al-Qayyum, asking Allah Azza wa Jal, the ever-living and the sustainer of all creation, the one who there is no God worthy of worship but Him, to make it easy for this particular person and for all of the reverts who are in that situation where they are under pressure and in difficulty because of the environment that they're in. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Al-Fattah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the one who opens things up to open up the doors for them and to make it easy for them and to give them the ability to be able to come out from that environment into an environment where they can worship Allah with ease. And I'm going to try inshallah ta'ala to answer the different aspects of this question as best as possible, uh, seeking the help of Allah Azza wa Jal. So first of all, we have a very important principle in Islam, and that principle is taken from the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Fear Allah Azza wa Jal as much as you can. Have as much taqwa, and just for the purpose of a quick translation, have as much fear of Allah as you can. Protect yourself from the punishment of Allah as much as you can. So we're always going to be saying to that new Muslim, to that revert, we're going to be saying to them that do your very best, do whatever you can to do the right thing, Try to come as close to it as you can and do the best that you're able to do. And that's going to be sort of a, a principle for you. But I'm now going to go into a little bit more detail also to try and give you some more specific advice. But as a general principle in Islam, you always try to do the best that you can. And that's why there is a hadith, a narration from our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which was reported by the noble companion Abi Hurairah. And in this narration, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, فَإِذَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ فَأْتُوا مِنْهُ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ وَإِذَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ فَدَعُوا And in a narration, فَاجْتَنِبُوا He said that if I command you to do something, then do whatever you are able from it. And if I forbid you from something, then leave it. Or in another narration, keep away from it. So really, we, we want to start with that principle because I believe that there's many things in terms of, of the situation of this new Muslim that they might come across where they're not able to do everything the way they would want to. So you do as much of it in the best possible way as you can. But there is a difference between the prohibitions and the commands. And that's why in this hadith, there's a difference that is made between the two and the prohibitions. It's easier to leave them because something that's wrong, you just have to stop doing it. But as for what things you have to do, like you have to do this, you have to do your prayers and give your zakah, and you have to fast the month of Ramadan, then you do the best that you possibly can and the most that you possibly can in the circumstances that you are in. And Allah is the told us in the Quran, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah doesn't burden a person with more than they can bear. And now I want to move on with my advice uh, and answer to this question. And I want to talk a little bit about dealing with the non-Muslim parents as well, because I just believe that if we have a revert in the situation, and there are probably many, many people in this uh, situation uh, in, you know, around the world, I want to also give some general principles that will help you, inshallah. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in Surah Luqman in ayah number 15, وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفَةً وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيْهِ 
ثم إلي مرجعكم فأنبئكم بما كنتم تعملون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us if your parents they compel you and they force you to make a partner with me in that which you have no knowledge of then do not obey them but accompany them in this world in the right way in the best way so what's really important here is that when it comes to being forced by non-Muslim parents or being compelled even if they compel you to make a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if they compel you, compel you and force you and put pressure on you with regard to your religion there are two things number one you must not obey them in that you must not agree with them in that and number two you mustn't cut off from them and be rude or be uh, bad towards them rather you have to do your very very best to help them and to support them in this world but you can't obey them if they tell you to do something that is wrong so we, we hope that principle or that concept will really help the new muslim who is uh, struggling with this so now we come to the issue of concealing a person's uh, iman a person who doesn't tell uh, because in the, in the this question was worded in, in a very long way we just summarized it for the video uh, but the longer question mentioned that the person had was concealing their iman and wasn't telling their parents about their faith we have an evidence for this in the story of the of the islam of a companion whose name was abu dhar and that the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said to him ya abu dhar uktum hadha al amr o abu dhar conceal this matter and he conceal your islam and this hadith is narrated by al bukhari and others as well and ibn taymiyyah he said rahimahullah ta'ala wa kitmanu al din shay'un wa idharu al din al batil shay'un akhar and this is a very important point for the questioner. He said, concealing your religion is one thing and saying you're part of another religion is something else. He said, فَهَذَا لَمْ يُبَحُ اللَّهُ قَطْ إِلَّا لِمَنْ أُكْرِهُ بِحَيْثُ أُبِيحُ لَهُ النُّطْقْ بِكَلِمَةِ الْكُفْرِ وَاللَّهُ تَعَالَى قَدْ فَرَّقَ بَيْنَ الْمُنَافِقِ وَالْمُكْرَهِ he said, Shaykh Islam, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he said that concealing your religion is one thing and, and telling them that you are another religion is a different thing. He said, for this, Allah did not allow someone to say that they are in a different religion except for the one that is forced, i.e. the one that is forced through a threat of death or they fear they're going to lose their life or they are tortured. This is the one who it's allowed for them to say, I'm not a Muslim. As for concealing your religion, just keeping it quiet, this is a totally different matter and this is easier and lighter in the sight of Allah that it is possible for a person to conceal their religion not to tell what religion they are or not to openly tell the people that they are a Muslim and I know that's what the questioner seemed to highlight but I wanted to differentiate between these matters the, ma the difference between telling someone that I'm a Christian I believe in Christianity or saying words like somebody who says that uh, Jesus is God for example this is only allowed for the one who is in the threat of death or severe uh, torture or uh, beating or something like that. As for just not telling people you're a Muslim, this is something where we would give the following advice. We would say to this person, not telling people you're a Muslim brings about its own difficulties and hardships. And we would not advise that and we would not say that that is the asl, that's not the original way that a Muslim should be because Allah said وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثِ As for the blessings of your Lord, tell the people about them. And more than one of the scholars of tafsir, they said that this means to speak to the people about Islam and to tell people about Islam. So ultimately the basic concept for the Muslim is that you should be telling the people about Islam and you should be happy to tell the people that you're a Muslim. However, if you fear a hardship upon yourself and you are scared that something bad will happen to you, then it is permissible for you to conceal your Iman. And you shouldn't go to the level of saying that you're a non-Muslim or doing non-Muslim practices like going to a church or a temple. That is in only the most extreme of uh, cases where the biggest threat and the most danger is there for the person. The next issue that we have is regarding the prayer. The person asked about their praying and they said that many times when the door opens, they, they leave their prayer because they are scared that their family would find out. 
And uh, in this we have a statement of Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran in which Allah Azza wa Jal said وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَى مُوسَى وَأَخِيهِ أَن تَبَوَّأَ لِقَوْمِكُمَا بِمِصْرَ بُيُوتًا وَجَعَلُوا بُيُوتَكُمْ قِبْلَةً وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَةً وَبَشِّرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ we reveal to Musa and his brother, to Moses and his brother, to uh, establish for your people houses in Egypt and to make your houses qibla, i.e. to make your houses the place where you pray. And some of the scholars of tafsir, Ibrahim al-Nakhai, he said it, and others, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, kanu khaifin, fa'umiru an yusallu fi buyutihim. They were scared, so they were commanded to pray in their homes. So in this, it tells us the permissibility for you to pray in your room if you're scared of your family finding out and you're, you really believe that it's going to harm you. And as we said, it's far better for you to find a way to tell them about Islam if you're able to, rather than living with that fear because it's extremely hard to live with it for a long period of time. But if you found a situation where you couldn't get out of it and that's the situation that you're in, then you can pray in your room uh, and you can conceal that from them. And the prayer has to be prayed at fixed times. Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitaban muqoota. The prayer has been appointed and fixed for the believers at those fixed times. But obviously, that time is a uh, that time is a band of time, right? So it doesn't mean that there is a that you have to pray at one minute past one, for example. You have a band of time from one prayer to the start of the next prayer with the exception of Fajr which ends at the time of sunrise and Isha which ends ideally at half the night in most circumstances at half of the night so we understood there's a there's a period of time in which to pray this is important in this question so there are two uh, types of fear here there is a fear which is constant all the time like the person is just, I can't pray, I barely can pray one of my prayers. This is a constant fear. And in this uh, situation of the constant fear, then what might be more suitable is to look at joining between the prayers, like joining Dhuhr to Asr, uh, joining Maghrib to Isha. And the person prays however they can, even if they have to pray lying down on their side, as if they are asleep or sitting down, as if they are sitting, What they pray however they can. But ultimately, if you are in a state of constant observation and constant fear, the ruling is different from the occasional time, meaning I can pray in my room, but sometimes uh, my uh, parents open the door from time to time, sometimes during the day. So in this situation, uh, one of two situations apply, one of two conditions apply. Either there is no time left for the prayer, in which case you continue praying however you can. If there is no time left for the prayer, you have to pray. You have to pray. You can't stop praying. But you pray however you can. However it's possible for you to pray, you pray. That's in the situation where there is no time left. But presuming there is time left, if there is time left to repeat the prayer, there is no harm in you breaking your prayer in this situation. There is no harm in the person breaking their prayer and then uh, repeating the prayer, presuming there is time left to repeat the prayer. And if the person needs to join between Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha in certain situations from time to time, because that day they're struggling, then they can do that, inshallah. However, also we should bear in mind that if a person is able to avoid breaking their prayer, this is what they should do. So as an example for this, the door opens, the person doesn't know if the parent's going to walk in and talk to them or if the parent is going to um, just knock the door or if they just misheard it. So if they break the prayer every time, some of the scholars, they mention about this, that they mentioned it from, from somewhat that it's, it's particularly with regards to sometimes women who fear for their child or something, that people break their prayers all the time and it's not allowed for a person to break their fard prayer except in, in a very serious situation. So the first thing is when you hear that noise of the door opening, you don't need to break your prayer. Just stop what you're doing. And even if you have to make a small movement, like put your hands down by your sides, or that you just have to move slightly without changing your, uh, like too much away from the qibla or something like that, 
uh, maybe the person is in the tashahud position and they change just to sit normally and wait and see if there's a need to break the prayer or not. Then if there is a real fear that the person fears a severe harm for themselves, then they can break the prayer and repeat it. But there has to be this real fear. And that's why we, we continue to emphasize to this particular person that finding a way to tell your parents about your Islam, generally speaking, is the route that you want to go down. That's where you want to go to, Allahumma, unless the fear is, is very, very severe and you fear extreme harm upon yourself. Because the, the hardship of this praying in secret and repeating the prayer is, is very, very difficult. But that's some advice that we want on that particular issue. The question also mentioned in this description of the problem that they are facing, they mentioned that there is very loud music and whether they could put earphones on in order to uh, remove the distractions. And from this we have something we can allude to from a hadith of our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. In this hadith the Prophet sallallahu prayed and in his prayer he became distracted by the patterns on this, uh, in this piece of uh, material. He became distracted by it and he uh, he said that this has these patterns or these things have distracted me in my prayer and he commanded for a different material to be brought. And Imam al-Hafidh ibn Hajar, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned that this hadith can be an evidence for the need to remove all anything which distracts you in the prayer. So we have to remove the distractions. And in some of the statements of some of the people of knowledge, we found a statement that they said that it is... Uh, it is permissible for a person to put uh, earplugs or to put something to block the noise uh, from them if that's what they have to do. And they said that people shouldn't do this out of a, a need to get near to Allah, and that's correct. People shouldn't try, like it shouldn't be the case that everyone watching this video says, oh, that will really help my kids make noise, I should put earplugs. That's not the case. But for the person in a situation like the one that is mentioned, where this person is, is suffering from the loud music, and they, their parents are not turning it off and they're concealing their faith, then if the person puts earplugs in or something to block their ears so that the noise goes down, or if they put something um, that will, you know, I don't think playing Quran is ideal because that's going to also distract you from your own Quran that you're reciting in the prayer. But maybe you could have, if you had like a noise cancelling headphone or something that would uh, switch off the noise or lower the noise down. And perhaps this is something that in this unique situation it could be allowed in order to get the, the least harm of the situation or the best out of a bad situation. But we continue to emphasize and encourage this new Muslim that the earliest opportunity to look for every opportunity to leave the place and to leave where they are uh, and not to worry about it, not to feel like that, uh, not to feel that they might suffer or they might have difficulty, rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up for them and Allah azza wa will make it easy for them. So I really genuinely advise them to, to do everything they can to get themselves out of, uh, out of this situation. And the last part of the question, they said that they spend a lot of time serving their non-Muslim parents. And they mentioned that when they're serving their non-Muslim parents in Ramadan, it gets to the situation where their ibadat suffer. So I would say in this that there are really three situations. We can say two and we'll add a third one on the end. The first is that they are making you busy away from the faridah, the obligatory actions. Like you can't pray your prayer, five daily prayers on time and so on. And the second one is they're making you busy away from the nawafil, the voluntary actions. So as for the voluntary actions, then we have a hadith, a very famous hadith, the hadith of Abi Huraira regarding the regarding uh, Juraj, the, the, the monk, and that his mother called him and he was in a voluntary prayer. This is in the time before Islam. She called him and he was in a voluntary prayer. And he said, uh, he said, Allahumma ummi wa salati. He said, oh Allah, should I answer my mother or, or should I continue praying? And this was the voluntary prayer. This was the, the voluntary prayer. So in the end, she made dua. Uh, against him and a very terrible situation happened to him. So I would suggest that if it is for the nawafil, this matter is not so bad. You can, you know, you can you can just look at to, to do the optional deeds at a different time, try to restructure them around your parents' needs. But if it is for the faridah, then 
as we heard in the ayah that I mentioned earlier, وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفَ You can't obey them in leaving something that is obligatory, but you have to be so nice and kind and gentle to them when you are doing that. But at the same time, don't completely exclude your options to, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and find those opportunities to do that in a way that is pleasing to Allah, in a way that doesn't upset your parents, inshallah. But you can't obey your parents if it means disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what Allah Azza wa Jal made easy for me to mention. Allah knows best. Wassalatu wassalam ala Nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.